Hello again! In this video, we'll continue our overview of Oriental beliefs with regard to the netherworld and we'll show you some aspects of the Mesopotamian conception of the afterlife. A good starting point for this overview is to see what sources we have at our disposal to study the Mesopotamian netherworld. By far the most important sources are literary texts, where people or gods descend into the netherworld and give some depiction of it. Let's give you two examples of such compositions. In a myth known as Ishtar's descent to the netherworld, the goddess Ishtar tries to take control over the netherworld by deposing her sister, who is the queen of the netherworld. But instead, Ishtar herself is captured. The sister is called Ereshkigal in Sumerian, in Akkadian her name is Alatum. The second example is the story of Nergal and Ereshkigal, which explains how a god called Nergal became the king of the netherworld by marrying Ereshkigal. A second and third group of sources are prayers to the netherworld deities, for example to Nergal, and funerary rituals. From these sources, we can reconstruct the following picture of the Mesopotamian netherworld. Let's start by saying that the Mesopotamian netherworld had various names. In the 3rd millennium BCE, the Sumerians called the netherworld Kur, which means mountain, probably because they located it in the distant mountains outside of Sumer. At the beginning of the 2nd millennium BCE, the standard name became Ki, which means earth implying that the netherworld was now located below the ground. In Akkadian, the usual name was also Ertsetu, Earth. Other names, such as Land of No Return, Land of Wailing, Remote Land, House of Death, House of Dust and House of Darkness also give us information about the representation of this gloomy place. Thus, the Mesopotamian netherworld was physically located just below the earth and its main entrances were, according to the Sumerians and Akkadians, graves, mountains and steppes. Doesn't this remind you of something? Yes, we mentioned mountains and steppes in our video on demons. This Mesopotamian netherworld was also organized as a kind of parallel society where the divine royal couple being Nergal and his wife Ereshkigal, ruling as kings over their subjects, the spirits of the dead. And with a lavishly decorated royal palace, gates, a full juridical system, and so on. But we will go deeper into this later on. Nevertheless, despite the physical proximity between the netherworld and the human world, access to the netherworld was not very easy. A deceased person had to make an arduous journey to the netherworld. First of all, he had to cross a demon-infested steppe and later on, he had to cross the Hubur River with the assistance of a person named Khumuttabal, which means, quick, take me there. Here, we can clearly see the parallel with ancient Greek beliefs, according to which the dead had to cross the river Styx with the help of the pharaoh Charon in order to reach the netherworld. You will hear more about this in another unit. After crossing the river, the deceased had to be admitted by the gatekeeper, who was called Bidu, which means open up. Finally, the ghost of the deceased had to appear before the court of the Anunnaki, a group of gods. This court instructed the ghost about the rules of the netherworld and assigned him a place in it. The netherworld scribe, Geshti Nana, in this way, checked that the ghost was not an undesired visitor. In this case, he would immediately be expelled. When a ghost, for example of a criminal, was not accepted, he was de facto condemned to eternal sleeplessness and he didn't receive any funerary offerings. On the other hand, sick and handicapped people did have access to the netherworld. Lepers would simply be kept separate from the others. So, as you can see, 
the concept of some kind of judgment is common to the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian representations of what happens to humans after they die. But what seems to be specifically Mesopotamian is that there were two other netherworld courts. The first one was presided over by the famous mythological hero Gilgamesh and dealt with crimes committed in the netherworld itself. The second one was presided over by the sun god Shamash, whose daily cyclic journey brought him in contact with both living and dead persons. Once again, the similarity with the Egyptian view on the sun's journey is striking, isn't it? Logically enough, this court dealt with problems related to the interaction of the world of the living and the world of the dead. For instance, when goats pestered the living, or when the living did not give the necessary funerary offerings to the ghosts. Some information on the social hierarchy in the netherworld can be found in the myth called Gilgamesh, Enkidu and the netherworld. In the following fragment, a person called Enkidu, who had been able to visit the netherworld, is questioned by Gilgamesh. He who had one son, have you seen him? I have seen him. He weeps bitterly at the nail which was driven into his wall. He who had six sons, have you seen him? I have seen him. He is cheerful as a plowman. He who had seven sons, have you seen him? I have seen him. As a companion of the gods, he sits on a chair and listens to judgments. Did you see the palace eunuch? I have seen him. Like a useless stick, he is propped in a corner. Have you seen him whose ghost has no one to care for him? I have seen him. He eats what scrapped off the out of cooking pots and crust of bread which are thrown into the street. This fragment already tells us something of life in the netherworld once the dead spirit was allowed access. In this context, three myths contain passages which tell us a lot about Mesopotamian afterlife's beliefs. These are the two previously mentioned compositions called Ishtar's Descent to the Netherworld and Nergal and Ereshkigal, as well as the famous Epic of Gilgamesh. The following fragment from Ishtar's Descent contains a nice description of netherworld life. To the netherworld, land of no return, Ishtar, daughter of Sin, set her mind. Indeed, the daughter of Sin set her mind. To the gloomy house, seat of the netherworld, to the house which none lives, one tears. To the world whose journey has no return. To the house whose entrance are bereft of light. Where dust is their sustenance and clay their food. They see no light, but dwell in darkness. They are clothed like birds in wings for garments. And dust has gathered on the door and bolt. Shall I eat clay for bread? Shall I drink dirty water for beer? Judging by these texts, it is clear that the Mesopotamian netherworld was considered a gloomy place, shadowy, dark and dry. Clay served as food instead of bread, and the ghosts had to drink dirty water. Nevertheless, this negative image must be amended. The sun god Shamash visited the netherworld every day on his road. In addition, and as already mentioned, some ghosts, especially those with many children, could eat bread and drink clean water. It must also be pointed out that the netherworld had a more negative image in Akkadian belief than in Sumerian belief. This is nicely illustrated by Ishtar's descent which exists in a Sumerian as well as in an Akkadian version. In the Sumerian version, the netherworld is simply described as a place of dust and as a land of no return. Undoubtedly, Sumerian dead persons were better off than their Akkadian neighbors. To sum up, 
it can be said that the Mesopotamian netherworld was a rather gloomy and shadowy place, not to be compared with the Jewish, Christian and Islamic concept of heaven and hell. There were no moral judgments either. Nevertheless, there are some parallels with some popular beliefs, the main one being the universal belief in the possibility that the ghosts of the dead may visit the world of the living, like in the modern concept of Halloween. This is what we wanted to share with you about the Mesopotamian concepts of afterlife. In the next video, you will see how these things worked in two major neighboring regions. Ancient Anatolia, which is modern Turkey, and ancient Iran. Mm -hmm.